This is WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. You are listening to One Human Nation with your host, Sandy Batiste. This program will be talking about race and race relations in your community and nationally. Our goal is to be open, honest, and productive. Welcome to the One Human Nation show. I'm your host, Sandy Batiste, and welcome to today's show where we continue our conversations about race and race reconciliation in the United States in a safe, honest, open, and productive environment. The viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. So on today's show, we will have a guest that will be calling in in about 15 minutes. And in order to get us in the right mindset for that particular phone call, um, it does require us looking at a concept that we've been talking about a lot, learning about a lot, um, and that's the iceberg culture. So if you have the opportunity, and I know some of you are driving, so this is not going to be where you can do this, but if you have the opportunity, go to the One Human Nation website, and that's onehumannation.info. Again, the website is www.onehumannation.info. And when you go to that website, you'll be able to see um, one of the graphics where I've posted the cultural iceberg. And it's been up there for a while because it is an important part of how we um, go through this process of learning how to communicate with each other, how to engage, especially when there are cultural differences. And some of those cultural differences are obvious And in the cultural iceberg, that graphic shows externally what's above the line. So it's the things you can see, whether it's food, flags, festivals, holidays, um, arts and crafts, performance, language. That's the external surface culture that you see. And then when you picture the internal or deep culture, that's what's below the surface. That are th- th- Those are things that relate to communication, styles and rules, and that's everything from facial expressions, gestures, touching, conversational patterns in different social situations, tone of voice, eye contact. Uh, it also talks, uh, deep culture gets into our notions of courtesy and manners, friendship, leadership, beauty, concepts of self and time, past and future, fairness and justice, and it goes on and on and on. So it, this is going to be um, an important graphic for you to have a picture in your mind as we continue with today's show. And on that note, because I I try to um, filter what comes into my world so I can um, be uh, non-judgmental when I come on the show, especially the day of the show, I try to, to try to make sure that I don't have too much of um, judgment issues coming into my world. But there's one thing I do want to um, just mention <laughs> um, that came up, I think this was probably last week. And it's in reference to a celebrity talk show person, comedian, whatever. I'm not going to say the name that um, as a white male mentioned the N word as part of their routine. So some of you will get the gist of who this person was. So I'm not going to go into that. The, The reason I'm bringing it up is just to say this is another example of why we have to go through this process of understanding deep culture, internal culture. Um, There were some people that came to this person's defense that were black that said, oh, it's it's okay to, you know, it it was just in the context of X, Y, Z. I didn't read all the details because here's my personal opinion. 
in my personal opinion, it's never a good time to um, or entertainment to mention the N word. Um, so I just want to mention that because it really speaks to the core of how invasive this problem is when we talk about race and reconciliation to go through a healing process so that we can get to justice. And as long as these kinds of uh, incidents continue to occur, and in my opinion, it doesn't matter if the person is black, white, what, whatever um, nationality, in, in no situation is the N-word acceptable. It is, should be totally obliterated from all of our minds. If there was a way to do that, <laughs> that, would be, that would be huge and ideal. So I'm, I wanted to mention that just before we get into the show, because that to me is a, a prime example of why we really have to look closely at internal culture. And sometimes it's not, um, it's, it's, it's so subconscious. We're not aware of that bias and what that means and the impact that it has. Um, so Keep that in mind as we continue through this journey of talking about race and what it will take to get through a process of reconciliation, to go through a healing process, um, to get to justice so that at you know, some point in time, whether it's in my lifetime or your lifetime, but the goal, the, the, you know, the outcome would be that we start becoming one human nation. And that's the reason for the title of the show, One Human Nation. And what is it going to take for us to get there? A huge part of this is understanding the cultural iceberg concept, that graphic, and start really digging into your relationships and your interactions with people and what's being said and what your response is to what's being said and how should you respond? Um, how should you take action? So the other part that I want to to um, share with you today, because I've mentioned it before, but I want to get a little bit deeper into it today. I've mentioned the book, The Wolf Shall Dwell with the Lamb by Eric Law. And it's a book that we use as part of the One Human Race series. But I, I want to specifically point out to you um, when he talks about um, in this book, he, he talks about this in more detail um, to really dig deeply into internal culture. And one of the aspects of that is looking specifically at the differences in perceptions of personal power among the different cultures. And sometimes that's a hard concept to get in, in mind because the perception of personal power is our own understanding of our ability to change our environment. So when we're looking at interpersonal relationships, the power, it may not be that you perceive that you have the power or the influence, or you may have um, the influence and it's totally unconscious. So the way it's structured in our culture in the United States is the culture that's the dominant culture is the white culture. So if you happen to fall into that bucket, you have the power, whether you want to have it or not, <laughs> really. Um, it, it's not a, it, unfortunately, it's not a, a case of you can opt out and say, well, you know what? I really don't want to have the power. I don't want to play those games. Um, I understand what Sandy's saying, but I, I don't agree with that. Well, start testing that as you go through your day-to-day -day activities, or especially if you're in a work environment where agendas are being set or different organizations that you may be involved in. Start taking a look at how that perception of power is playing out. Who's setting the agenda? Who's talking? Who's feeling comfortable to participate in the conversation? Because that all goes to internal culture. And and no one wants to be in a situation where they feel uncomfortable or judged um, or it has a negative impact to the point that uh, they even lose their, their job, um, their income. So until we get to that point of understanding, a, a better understanding of how huge it is, the deep culture, the unconscious bias, and what's going on that's just 
it's just there. It's part of our um, instinct. It's part of our culture. And that's why I love the title of the book, The Wolf Shall Dwell with the Lamb, because there is a certain instinct that when you look at a wolf's behavior, that's a more predator behavior. If you look at a lamb, that doesn't mean that with people of color, everybody's meek and mild, but the lamb has an understanding of when they're in a situation that can be detrimental (laughs) to their health. And so, you know, you you have options that you take. You either avoid the situation um, or if you find yourself in that situation that could be dangerous, you know, you probably bring very little attention to yourself. Um, And this all filters up into all of our systems in our political system, our school systems, the prison system, even the interaction within our families, the perception of power and who has the power. So as we um, get ready to prepare for the caller that I'll be calling in, I'm just going to give you just a a little bit of information so we can all be um, in the mindset because the stories that we're going to hear, I want you to keep in mind that it's not about judgment. Our goal is to create a safe, honest, open and productive environment. And um, you, you as the listener are also welcome to participate in the show by sending your story or emailing me, contacting me ahead of time. And we get to chat um, to make sure that how we're going to go through this process is going to be, I like to refer to it as a win-win because we want to have productive dialogues. So the the caller that's going to be calling in, um, Stephen, um, made the decision with his partner as a white male um, to adopt two black males. And I'm not sure, and I'll let Stephen clarify on this when he calls in, I think they're brothers. Um, and, and what this what this process entailed because he adopted them when at a young age and now they're, they're hitting the teen years and one has already hit the teen years. So it's going to be a very um, interesting conversation, his stories, because it really speaks to what you don't know about internal culture until you really are in the situation as part of your, your life and it can it can have some um, detrimental impacts. It, it also requires a certain amount of openness and being willing to be in situations that are going to be uncomfortable. But it's what you do um, from what I the conversations that I have with people that find themselves in, in this situation is it's like, we, you know, I, I hear it repeatedly. They didn't really know about the internal culture until they adopted a child of color. They did. They had no idea. Um, and, and a lot of them will say, you know, we had, you know, we had black friends and, and, you know, we, we really didn't know and um, they really didn't tell us. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And, and part of it is, were you going to be at that point to hear it? Um, because it's such a subtle thing and it's um, very difficult to even sometimes talk about it and conceptualize it for someone else to to understand it until they actually participate in it to see it demonstrated. So as we continue with the show today, keep in mind um, one of our mantras that we really embrace, and it's from um, our one of our communication agreements from the race, the power of an illusion um, series that we use in the one human race initiative. And that is about you may have an emotional reaction to something you view, hear or experience. And be aware, you know, try to stay open Um, But take care of yourself, try to stay engaged and realize that the divine can be found in the tension. Uh, Be open to information regarding how the concept of race and the history of the development of institutional systemic racism impact our community in places of work as well as worship. 
in just the the day to day walk of even going to the grocery store or engaging in any kind of activity where there's a diverse culture. Start really thinking about who has the power in that situation and how would you feel and react if you were in the other person's shoes to start picturing that kind of dynamic goes towards, you know, how do we start engaging in um, really learning about cultural diversity? So I hear the caller calling in. And so we're going to go to a break and we'll be back. back with our guest. Um, Stephen, are you there? I'm here. Okay, perfect. So thanks for calling in and joining the One Human Nation show today. Um, uh, so I, I think because time moves so quickly, um, I, I kind of want to jump to the main story, but I understand the importance of you know, getting things kind of set up so the listeners know where, where you're coming from with, with sharing your story. Um, so give us an idea about where you grew up, um, if there were any stories about um, race, um, anything, you know, that gave you a negative or was it just not on the radar whatsoever in your environment growing up? Uh, I grew up in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, which is sort of a very strange place in 1958-60, and it was being built very quickly. but. It was um, it was suburban, and our house was actually right next to an Indian reservation. But my high school was very large. Um, my my grade school was pretty big. There were actually no people of color in the neighborhood where I grew up. Okay. And um, and until I got to high school, I never really was in contact with anyone of color. And the people that were in my high school, it was sort of a, a, a well-to-do area. My family was not. We were, we were definitely, you know, working middle class. But um, especially the African-American people that were there were two families that I remember very specifically, and they were quite wealthy. Okay. And, um, and so they, to me, they were always sort of, um, you know... Uh, something that I didn't understand but you know they were they were people that spoke like I spoke and they had everything in the world in a place where there was a lot of that going on okay. until I got to college though I, oh and I must say that that my dad has always been um, very racially intolerant and although he didn't say much he said small things and I don't remember things in particular mm. but I do remember um, I do remember uh, going down through um, South Phoenix and different parts of Phoenix, and I remember my parents locking the doors of the car. Okay. And even though things weren't spoken, there was a lot of that going on while I grew up. When I got to college, it was the first time that I ever actually interacted with a diverse world of people. Okay. And uh, I was at college in California, and there were people from around the world, and there were people from all parts of the country, and there were people... Um, uh, many people of color uh, in our school. And it was a private liberal arts college. And, you know, some of the people on the campus that were of color were strong leaders on the campus. And so not only was that part of my world, but my entire world was sort of opened up very wide when I left home and went to school in California because 
I really was very sheltered and very naive, and I didn't know it. Uh, okay. So that was that was how things began to open up for me, and I um, and I I uh, I left California and went to Texas after college because I had friends there. Okay. And it was a, it was an amazing thing because one of the one of my friends' dads was a, an attorney, and he got me a job at a private club that was on top of one of the big buildings downtown in Austin. I know exactly and, what club you're talking about, but we don't have to say the name. <laughs> <laughs> and I was one of three white staff there, and the other two was the general manager and the, and the assistant manager. Okay. And then the the entire rest of the staff was African American, and this club was um, a couple generations old at that time. I think maybe I don't know, but old enough to be to be um, very well known to the old community in Austin. Right. And again, my world was opened up because I had no idea. I know that you used an iceberg a lot to represent um, how right. people perceive each other's cultures. Right. And until that point, honestly, I had never been in contact with um, with people of great different socioeconomic background than myself, even if they were people of color. And these folks that I met when I started working at the Headliners Club were a whole different world to me. I mean, it was it was a wide. I was I walked inside an African American culture. Right. And there were older folks in that culture, um, people who had worked for 30 years at the club and, you know, were in their 60s and 70s. And there were young um, young men and women that were uh, working there. And I got to see all kinds of things, like how, how different generations interacted with each other, how right. people spoke to each other, what they said, what they didn't say how much of what they were saying I didn't understand at all. Right. It was like another la- <laughs> another language. <laughs> it was. It, well, it really was another language. Um, although there were several, I mean, everyone in that club, for the most part, was able to speak, um, I don't know if you're talking in linguistic terms, standard right. English. Right. But everyone also in that club was able to speak a different language that I didn't know. Right. And so um, it was fascinating for me, and it was also it also made me feel very small in a way, mm. because still I kept the world kept unfolding to me, and there was so much that I didn't know. And this was like, oh my god, you know, I know nothing. <laughs> and there was a gentleman there, uh, Ben, who ran the club, and uh, he had been he had been the manager and maitre d. Uh, of the staff of the club forever. And Ben taught me a lot of things about the world. He took me into the stairs one time because there was a gentleman from a very old Texas family who came every Friday night to have his dinner in there. And every Friday night, he would call Ben in after the dinner was served and he would have some complaints. Uh. And Ben told me, come here, watch this. And we went into the stairwell. And Ben was not a, sl- a slim man. He stood in place and jogged until he broke out a little bit of a sweat. He took a white handkerchief out of his pocket. He said, now follow me. And he walked in there. And I, I was not from anywhere near the South, and I had never seen this sort of relationship. And he walked into that dining room with this very famous man and started patting his forehead and said, yes, sir, yes, sir, Mr. What can I do for you? What can I do for you? Mm. And Ben didn't do anything except that. And when he left, the man was happy. <laughs> and then we went back. Then we went back and sat down at Ben's desk. And we went on about the evening. So that was that, that was an education. Yeah, that's when you really started uh, what we re- refer to as waking up. Yeah. That's when you started realizing that, you know, even though... Um, you grew up in an area where you didn't feel like you had any economic wealth. Um, there was the unconscious bias, the power that you did have, even though you didn't perceive it at the time. No, but 
But, you know, I did perceive it at the time because the members, of course, you know, almost completely were. I don't believe there were any African-American members unless, no, Barbara Jordan was a member of the club. Right. Yeah. No, I was thinking in terms of when you were younger. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that, you know, you weren't awake when you were younger. You no. started waking up when you had this experience at the club. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure when... Um, the staff that was working there with you or working as staff, that other language that they spoke was probably more so when they were around each other. It was beh- it was behind the scenes. See, in the right. Club. Yes, exactly. 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 And all of them, all of them um, took great pains to show me how little I knew, but not in an unkind way. Right. And I was invited um, out in the evenings you know, afterwards to go have a drink or something like that. Right. And uh, But what it was clear to me also while I was there is that I was treated differently by the white members of the club in uh, very subtle ways Right. Than, than the other staff that were my age in that club. The, the uh, people of color who had attained a certain generational age seemed immune to that. Once okay. you were that way, you received respect from. Them. But, but anyway, so yes, you're right. That's when I woke. Right. Okay. So, um, and I didn't know that as part of your story. So that that um, is kind of a good segue into, um, you know, talking about you know where you found yourself as an adult. And I think before we do that, we're going to take the break so I can get these corporate sponsor, um, our corporate sponsor, our corporate underwriter taken care of. But if you'll hold on, I'm going to do that. And then we'll start talking about the adult time and some decisions you made. Um, you know, if you're at that point to talk about the adoption, you know, process and what, how, how, how that came to be. So we'll, we'll take that after the break and, um, just hold on and we will get back to, um, this, interesting topic and I'm learning something new about you myself. So hold yeah. on and, and we'll take a we'll take a couple of announcements, okay? Thank you. This portion of W R U U L P Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by a grant from Sentient Bean, offering fair trade coffee, vegan and vegetarian food, and breakfast all day. Located at thirteen East Park Avenue, across the street from the tennis courts at Forsyth Park. Our menu and special events listings can be found at sentientbean.com. As a business, if you enjoy our programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. Let your customers, neighbors, and friends know that you share our vision of building a thriving community based on a thriving community based on diverse, vibrant radio programming. As a business partner, our listeners will know you support Savannah's only broad-based community radio station. Become a tower sponsor or underwriter. To check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org slash corporate. Again, to check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org forward slash corporate. Thank you for listening and to supporting WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, Community Radio with Global Soul. So, Stephen, are you still there? I am. Okay, perfect. Um, so, I, I, we've, you know, I've got a pretty good picture now of, of how you got to be, um, and I don't know any other way to put this, Stephen, so this is probably not politically correct or anything, but how you got to be an awake white person (laughs) so that's that's kind of where we are so from that point kind of walk us through what um you know i guess when you came to that decision or coming up to that process of um adoption what what was driving that uh i i had always wanted to be a parent although it was something that i had put on the shelf um I I don't know whether your listeners know, but I'm a gay man, and I was um, 
after that time that we were discussing, you know, things became very uncomfortable for the LBG community with right. um, AIDS and all different kinds of things. And we were trying to take care of our community and we were trying to get help for it. And so there was this, and I, I was on the board of the human rights campaign during that period of time. And, um, you know, a lot of, of, of civil rights and social activism. And there was a lot of, in Austin, especially there, there was a lot of um, crossover in communities that were struggling, and there was cooperation. Um, but once that once that period was gotten through, and I lost a, a partner during that period of time, mm. and so that period of time wiped away all of that kind of thing. All you did is sort of survive that, you know, and the, right. the post traumatic stress of that time. But things began to brighten after, um, after you know, 2000 and in the early 2000s, and life was uh, sort of repaired by that point. And I met a partner who was younger than I was, and um, we married in a church shortly thereafter, and he was convinced that he wanted to be a father from when he was little. And, um, and it reawakened in me that, that desire to do that. And so it's funny because, you know, we had to go through the, the foster care um, right. kind of training. And um, and what we found through all of that is that, um, you know, if we, well, we were in Travis County, which was a little bit different, but we found that we were not, um, there was no resistance to us doing this where we were. Okay. And we had tried an overseas adoption that didn't work because in Guatemala during that time, the whole thing had fallen apart and there was all kinds of, you know, scams of, you know, people selling children. And, right. things. and so we walked away from that. And so we put down for the foster care, you know, they said, what kind of child do you want? And we said, we don't really care, you know, what kind of child it is. We, we would like to think that we would be able to adopt a healthy child. Um, although, you know, along the way we would consider, you know, uh, some some disabilities or things, but um, we would like to think that we would be, you know, treated the same as any other right. couple as far as what kind of child we could get. We, and they asked us only a little tiny bit about, um, well, would you adopt children of color? And yes, we would. And they asked us about our experience with African-American culture, and we said, well, there wasn't really a lot in terms of, of children, um, and that that we weren't sure if we could give that child culturally what they needed, but we were willing to, to look at that. But that was, that was really something that we were concerned about whether or not we could do for that child. And so um, we had a couple of false starts, and I was getting very frustrated, and we had spent a lot of money trying to do private adoption. Mm. And um, and I was in Phoenix on business one night, and I was so frustrated, and I just looked up at the heavens, and I said, God, if you want me to be a child, you have to make it happen. Because I've done everything. I mean, if you want me to be, be a, a parent, you have parent. to make it yeah. happen. Because I've tried everything I know. And and I went to bed, um, and I woke up the next morning, and, and I got a call from an adoption agency in Chicago wow. that we had never talked with and wow. apparently someone on one of our other journey adoption journeys ended up at this um adoption agency and they called and they said we have a child that we think would be your home would be good for the thing is that this child um is ill and so there's going to be you know there's going to be a long road of recovery but if you're interested in this you need to come to chicago now wow and i thought is that the answer to the prayer? <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> right. it was the next morning on the phone, and it was so odd. And I called John, and I flew back to Austin, and we got on the plane, and we flew to uh, Chicago, and we met our son. And um, he had had a lot of problems, and he was a sick child. But About how his, old How old was he, Stephen? He was nine months. Nine months, wow, okay. And he was in a hospital, in Children's Hospital in Milwaukee, actually. And... But we walked in, and this child's eyes were so big and so bright. And it was, I mean, we were charmed wow. from the moment we met him. And 
um, 10 days later, we were on our way back to Texas for this child, and we went straight to Children's Hospital and checked in in Austin. Right. And he got well fairly quickly. Um, you know, it was a, it was an amazing thing, and they had prepared us to be, you know, to be in this shape for a long, long time. Right. But um, it, 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 the, the parenting a child, an interracial adoption, and parenting a child that's a different race from you, in the medical community, all of a sudden, immediately, the pushbacks began, you know, mm. because the child looked different than we did. So you'd be standing in line at a doctor's office, and they'd sign three people in, and then we'd stand there, and they'd go, what relationship are you to this child? Oh. You know? and, oh. and so, and I said, but you didn't ask the three people in front of us that. Right. And, and, and that could be, you know, that could be a father who'd taken the child from the mother, or it could be right. anybody. You know, just because they look the same doesn't mean that. And so it, that kind of thing started very quickly. Okay. The best thing that started happening, though, was that um, women, African-American women of a certain age, started interacting with us almost immediately, whether we were in stores or whether we were in school or where we were. They could see that we had a child that we loved, and right. that we may or may not be equipped to meet all of that child's needs. Right. And the, f- the first thing was we were told, don't cut this child's hair until he's a year old. And and we said, okay, but why? And there were three or four different stories about it, but it was clearly a cultural right. norm that right. you wouldn't do that. We had no idea. And the adoption agencies, nobody had any kind of preparation for that. Right. In in the time that we were adopting. Um, when the kids were a little bit older, and I'm not talking all that old, and we were in a store and they'd wander away from us, I'd see people from the store start watching them. Right. You know, I mean, it was, the whole experience was kind of crazy, but the best part about it was, even though I think there were quite a few people um, that weren't sure that we were they were they were black people that weren't sure that we should have that child right and that we should be raising that child and and there were a lot of people that actually felt quite hostile about it right. but it never stopped them from trying to help us interesting so let me let me just clarify because we um got the age you know when you adopted you know, your son when he was nine months old, but you kept saying with them. So um, I'm assuming then you adopted uh, again, right? We did. Simon came to us through, um, Eli was a private adoption. Simon came to, to us through Child Protective Services in Texas. Okay. And we had um, gone through the foster care training, and it was a foster to adopt program. And we knew that we wanted another child, and we wanted a child that, that Eli could look at someone in the family and say that this this person looks like looks, me. Okay. So we knew that we were adopting <laughs> right. an African American child. Second, and um, what's really funny is that uh, we were in a in a training class with I would say probably twenty four couples, and we ended up getting the first placement. Wow! And so I think that was I think that because and you know there's. Um, there's a, a, a court-appointed advocate right. that all adopted kids have. And um, and so they were, you know, that those advocates, you know, we had, we had judges and we had social workers and we had advocates looking at us, and I think everyone who adopts must have that experience. Right. But, but our home was a, was a good and wonderful place. And... And they brought Simon, I think, 17 months later. Okay. And he was 17 months old. So he was being born right about the time we were adopting Eli. Okay. And, um, and you know, the, the two kids are, are very different. Um, you know, they say that you know, people always say, oh, it's so good of you to adopt. 
I mean, you, you, you're saving that child. And I always say, we didn't do it to save the children. We did it to save us. Right. You know, I mean, this is something that was an imperative for us inside. And we hope that we can save the children at the same time. But it was a very selfish decision, which I think parenting is. And, and you know, they would say, oh, well, you never know what you're going to get when you adopt. And I say, well, you never know what you're going to get when you adopt. <laughs> this is either. true. <laughs> This is very, very true. Yes, yes. But having having the kids in school, um, you know, I had I had African American mothers tell me, you know, she goes, your kids won't be treated the same. And we knew that my my husband was a principal and a teacher for years right. before we moved to Nashville, and he's in Vanderbilt. But um, we knew that. But she said, I she said I get my kid up, I strap on my Uzi, and I go to school. Oh, boy. And I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> but what she was talking about is, is that my kids were not going to be treated the same way, even though these were good people right. that really felt like they were doing the best. They didn't understand that um, that everything they saw my kids doing looked different to them than what the little white head, blonde-haired kids were doing. Right. And we were in a charter school, we were in a public school, and we were in a private school. The private school was the best of all about that, but also John was was working at that school. Oh, and okay. he also was teaching, um, he was also teaching uh, classes on how to deal with African-American boys um, in a okay. different way and how to do lots of different kinds of things. And teaching them, you know, the level of discrimination that there was against kids of color in the school system. Right. And we got to a we got to a point where um, with our oldest child, Eli, because we swore we would never medicate our children, and right. we knew for a fact that that kids of color were over medicated in the school system and in in society in general. Right. And we, but we ended up with one of our children who really, really did need some medication support right. to be able to be in the education system and to be able to to make it work to manage to cope. Yeah, but it was such a hard decision for us, and we were really, even though John was a, a well-known educator and very, very gifted at what he did, you know, we were. We were judged on that because it was something we'd preached about for so long. Right. And um, and I guess that I guess that the story the story can't be told though without the fact that there's being two dads and two kids of color. Right. You know because exactly that's the story. You never know which way people are coming at you when they're coming at you. Then <laughs> do right. you? Right. Because <laughs> because you've got to stop and figure out which particular bias they're carrying or both. Exactly. And um and so, you know, we weren't we were not able our kids did not come home to a black home and, and we have not been able to teach them everything they would have learned in a black home. But we've had we've had um our our community includes people of color and their their professors and their lawyers and their teachers and their, right. you know, and so, and so we have leaned on those people heavily to help us. But one thing we have been able to teach our kids is that there are people who will judge you for who you are. Right. And you can't let that define you. And you can't leave yourself vulnerable to the way other people feel about you or you, you can't make it. And so I think that that partially we've been able to give them that, but we feel um, we know at this point our kids are thirteen and twelve. We know that that their experience is different than if they had grown up in a black home. But and so we're, I'm not I'm not justifying that. I'm just right. saying that that these children came to us in a way that it was clear that we were the parents. Right. So done a... I, I don't want to cut you off, but I'm looking at the time. So I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I get um, 
so, you know, to to one topic and then I'll ask you and you don't have to answer because I don't want to put you on the spot on the air. But we did talk about or I mentioned, uh, I think I sent you an email that said, you know, you've got so much in your story. Would you be willing to come back for a second part to kind of talk about, you know, kind of what's happening more now? Because I still want to talk about some of the experiences that um, you had with them culturally, like with hair, because that was one of the stories that I remembered you talking about back in Austin uh, when I met you. And um, I can't even remember whether it was at the church or some other venue um, because you were in real estate at one time also, but it was your experience about taking them to um, the barbershop, which for, for black children, whether you're male or female, it's like a big deal. It's like a rite of passage when you get to go to the barber shop or to the hairdresser, to the, what we call the beauty shop. So, um, can you share? Well, and let me tell you what, it's a rite of passage for the white dad sitting in the barber shop <laughs> with the black people. <laughs> so, and I have a visual because I know what Austin is all about. So, um, you don't have to go into that, but it, I, I think it's, uh, I think it is, um, true of anywhere in the United States going into a black barbershop or, you know, is, is a whole nother experience. So, so what sacred space, it is a sacred space because a lot more happens there than the hair, you know, um, a, a lot more happens there than the hair. So, um, what was that experience like when you uh, realized, okay, I'm, I'm going to need to, or I don't want to put words in your mouth. What, what made you decide that you needed to go to um, the a black barbershop? So the first one, um, but not the first one, but the one that was most significant was when Eli was um, starting to be in school and he was starting to talk about, I mean, he started talking about why I was thinking he was black when he was three, but, when it was clear that he was searching culturally, there the hurricane had blown over an amazing twister of dreads mm-hmm. from New Orleans. And he, I I met him, and I knew about his place, and we decided Eli would get dreadlocks. Okay. And so we were there every week for two to three hours, sometimes a little bit longer. And... Um, and it was a big place, and it was a it was a young place. It wasn't. There was a different part of it where women that weren't doing dreads went to. But this was a huge place, and I sat there um, for hours and hours and hours. And I let Eli go away into the milieu, right? And I sat over in the corner and read my book and stayed out of it. And right. I watched him see these young men come in. You know, seventeen, eighteen, twenty. You know. And, he would look at how they dressed. He would look at how they talked to each other, the, mm. what they laughed about, the things that he didn't understand. I mean, he really was absorbing right. an incredible amount of things. And, the, and they would come over and they would touch his head and, and his locks would start to get longer. And he used to say when we'd come out, he'd go, am I bleeding? Oh. They were twisted so tight. <laughs> oh, bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> but it was... Um, I mean, but it was it was the first time I think truly he had a sustained experience where he understood that there was a culture that was bonded to him and inside of him right. that he didn't really know about. Well, I think that is um I, I think that is and so how old was he then? You might have mentioned it and I, I didn't how old was he at when I, he I would have to say third grade. Third grade. Okay. And, oh, gosh, Stephen, I'm looking at the time, and believe it or not, we're almost up to the hour. Um, Would you be willing to come back and share some more of the the stories of what's happening with them now hitting the teen years? Because, you know, the teen years are tough regardless. (laughs) You know, know, because I remember my teen years, and frankly, I am surprised I survived. Um, Not not because of the race issue, but just that whole hormone thing and, you know, yeah. just the rebellion and um, just not... And then being, imagine being an adopted kid right. who had such right. early trauma and then in a white family and then, you know, we moved right. to Nashville and all of a sudden he's in contact with, with people who, 
who don't speak the language he speaks, but he's fascinated by it. And right. he's raging with hormones and everything. Yeah, you're right. Okay, it's so hard. it's hard right now. Yeah, so I I would like to capture that if you know I'll get together with you um, off the air and see if you don't have to answer now unless it works for you. We can do a follow. No, I'm, if if I'm if you want me, I'll come back. Okay, so next week Thursday for the listeners, we will have a follow up conversation with Stephen, so we can talk about the teen years. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. I'll look forward to talking to you. Okay, thank you. And I'll be in touch before then, Stephen. And uh, thanks so much for sharing your stories and being um, open and honest so we can have this productive conversation about race and um, the the sensitive conversation about being, you know, a gay couple. And I, I really do appreciate that. I, I do appreciate that. So um, at right, this well. point, I will sign off with you and finish up with the listeners so we can get ready right. for the I'll six o'clock show. Week. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. So we are close to the top of the hour. Um, believe it or not, it was going along very quickly. And I do appreciate Stephen being very open um, and honest about this journey that they're on with their sons. And um, I invite you, you can share your story also, or if you uh, want to email me, you can do so at my story at one human nation dot info. We also have a Facebook page now one human nation. So if you want to connect with me on the Facebook page, that's also um, another place that you can see the um, graphic for the iceberg culture and we're going to get even deeper into this next week with Stephen because this is where it's getting into the deep culture. It's the things that um, are so unconscious that we don't realize that's there. And um, so it, it'll be interesting to pick up that story, but I recommend that you definitely um, start looking into your internal culture and the internal culture that your children are exposed to. And it may not be as drastic as the situation that um, Stephen and his family are in, but it still, um, it still can be pretty intense. So at this point in time, we are going to be finishing up and signing off for the one human nation show. You can, uh, again, check out our information posted at the website, www.onehumannation.info. And next up are going to be um, the sounds coming from Sound Limit with Troy Stoner. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to chatting with you next week.